Well, hello there, everyone. This is another web presentation for the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council, April the 30th, 2020. I gotta be honest, I thought about not doing a web presentation for this week. We put a lot on into the virtual pasture walk last week, and quite honestly, we're facing some tough times in agriculture today. Uh, we've got some processors that have shut down. Uh, as a result, we've got farmers that are forced to make some very tough decisions. And uh, as a result of the bottleneck and processing, we're also facing some possible sh food shortages and uh, just tough times for agriculture. So it, it didn't seem right at first to want to do a web presentation with all the other things going on in the world. But And if you're turning into this for a silver lining or a shining star, I'm afraid those solutions are going to have to come from someone smarter than me. I've got my own ideas and I'd be glad to talk with you about them, but this just isn't the right place. But what I will say is I learned a long time ago that tough times don't last, tough people do. And I'll bet on the resiliency of the American farmer to come up with solutions every single time. And if there's anything that I, as well as anybody that's involved with Eastern Ohio Grazing Council is proud of, it's that we've talked about things over the years, tools to help uh, in situations that we seem to be faced with. We've talked about forest production and soil health and uh, cutting our feed costs, cutting our overall costs, uh, about profitability and sustainability and how those two things are linked. And um, hopefully tools to help us in situations like this. So as I thought about all that, I thought uh, I didn't feel like doing a web presentation, but along with the fact that, uh, that I find myself turning off the 24 hour news cycle and turning on a podcast or a web presentation that I can watch and put some positive spin on things, I thought, how could I not do a web presentation for this week? Maybe there are folks out there in Eastern Ohio grazing community that are doing the same thing I'm doing, using these pres web presentations for that purpose. So I thought a long time ago I wanted to continue our focus on soil health, and uh, just so happens it comes this week, and um, I, I guess as I've thought more, how better than this week to focus on things from the ground up. So let's go ahead and do just that. So why soil health? Uh, I'm not going to bore you with reading the definitions that are on there, but I guess for, for me, it's, it's what is soil health to me. And soil health to me is regenerating our soil, uh, making it more resilient, able to produce a better product, able to produce a better forage in this case, to, to produce better animals, uh, hold more rainwater, hold more soil life, produce better plants in general. Um, also, in the last few weeks, as I've been listening to podcasts and other things, I've realized that something that I never thought about before, but most of our soils in North America at this point are considered degraded. And uh, that's just from human intervention. Uh, it's from our cropping systems, and from our grazing systems, and from all the things that we've done to the soil over the centuries that we've been here. And I know that somewhere someone's listening to this and saying, well, I'm a fourth generation farmer and how dare you say that my grandfather mistreated the soil. And I don't mean it that way. I mean that your grandfather was doing things the best way that they knew how. And uh, we, we've just come to a point where we've learned to, to do better, to do things better and to treat our soil better. And, and we've learned things about the soil that we never thought about in the past. And, and it's the focus that our soils are degraded and wanting to regenerate those soils that gets me excited about soil health. Regenerating our soils to, um, to pre-us, to, to pre-our intervention. And, and there's even guys that are, that are regenerating their soil to a state that's probably even better than, than soils were when we came to this country. So that's what soil health is to me it's the regeneration of the soil and and making it more resilient and, and more productive for our uses and also 
or sustainable, something that's going to last and, and, and stay with us. It's that thought of leaving the land better than we found it. And soil health is just a big uh, consideration in that thought. Also with soil health, for me, um, when I came to work, uh, we were doing a lot of things. And, and when we started doing grazing plans and talking about managed and intensive grazing, it really was the, the catch-all for farmers. It really, if we could get a farmer talked into management intensive grazing, we could solve 99% of their problems. And soil health to me is what grazing plans are for the grazing folks. Only soil health covers all of our farmers, be they crop farmers, confinement operations, or grazing operations. If we can talk to a farmer about soil health and get them interested in soil health, we can solve 99% of their problems if we can just take that step and really get them interested in their soil health. <clears throat> soil health for me too is, is just a focus on the biological. You know, I'm, I'm university educated. Uh, I have a lot of soils classes in my background and we talked a lot about the chemical and the physical properties of the soil, but we very rarely ever talked about the biological components of the soil. Uh, I don't I don't know that that was something that they meant to do. We talked about organic matter briefly here and there, but we never really talked about the biological component. And part of soil health is realizing that our soil is not just merely a growing medium for our plants, that our soil is alive. It's a living, breathing organism, something that we've got to take care of. It's not just something that we pour fertilizer on and the plants grow out of. Um, there are millions of soil microbes in a handful of healthy soil and, and we've got to treat it as such and i know when i say that soil is a, a living organism people are going to say well you're saying that but there's millions of organisms and how can it how can that be well if we think about this you know the soil has millions of living organisms microbes in the soil in the same way that our digestive system has millions of living organisms that help us digest food same with cow the cow's got lots of microbes in their gut that helps them process forage or whatever we fed them so we consider them ourselves an organism we consider cows an organism so why would we not consider the soil a living organism that contains all those microbes and um with soil health we talk about the biology and we talk about the four keys to soil health and those are all focused on the biology of the soil it combines the chemical and the physical and the bio, biological, biological all together to, to come together and, and create what we're, our thoughts are on soil health. So for me, it comes down to, I've heard this said somewhere and I think it's a cool statement. It's not the cow, it's the how. And so many things go into that, but if we're thinking about soil health, especially in our grazing operations, um, the cow produces manure and, and other bodily functions that help feed and replenish the soil microbes. Those, those microbes are coming from cow manure. They're also being fed by the cow manure. Those microbes are then transporting water and soil nutrients to our plants. We think of the roots and plants as taking up water and taking up nutrients, and they do to an extent, but those soil microbes, the fungi and the bacteria, they help bring additional water and nutrients to the plants. They can extend their root systems as we get into soil health. We talk about those things. Makes the plant grow better. In turn, the plant feeds our cows, and we start the cycle all over again. So. Soil health for me is a focus on the biological along with the, the physical and the chemical properties of the soil. One of the best ways to really look at soil health is to watch a, a properly done rainfall simulator. And uh, we planned on doing a rainfall simulator at our April pasture walk, uh, but unfortunately we couldn't hold it. So I was thinking about pulling in a, a wet rainfall simulator video into this presentation, but I didn't want to do it both for time and uh, I'll, I'll let those things stay out there on YouTube. But if we go watch a, a really good rainfall simulator, it really shows us the keys to soil health and, and what soil health can do for our farm in particular. There are several good rainfall simulator videos out there on YouTube. I, I will 
say if you're watching this web presentation you're already at YouTube just click up here in the search bar uh, two good ones that I found JB Daniels and Buzz Clute did a rainfall simulator it was called the first cut um, they did a shorter video that's why this one's called the first cut you want to watch the first cut because it's longer and it really focuses on pasture soils uh, and then also uh, in 2017 soil health field day Ray Archuleta uh, did a wearing fall simulator down at Dave Brant's I was actually present for him to do that and they recorded put on YouTube both are very good rainfall simulator demonstrations so we're going to quickly go over the four keys to soil health the first one being minimize disturbance and i i kind of put these in here based on grazing but we'll talk a little bit about cropland as well but uh, when we talk about disturbance we talk about we, we think about tillage for the most part that's what we're talking about we want to minimize the disturbance now some disturbance isn't a bad thing there are places where we need maybe a little bit of disturbance when we talk about putting a hundred thousand pounds of animal on an acre that's a disturbance uh, but it's a it's usually a high intensity low duration event so we're only putting them on there for 12 hours or less uh, disturbance can be tillage and usually is what we consider to be tillage but we have to realize too that we cause disturbance with high rates of fertilizer um, with insecticides pesticides herbicides we can cause some disturbance we can cause disturbance with livestock we go back to that discussion about are we better off to have 365 cows on an acre for one day or one cow on an acre for 365 days and the answer to that is we're way better to have those 365 cows on one acre for one day than we are one cow for 365 days the disturbance is so much less so as we think about this in grazing terms i wanted to kind of focus on what, what we're doing well and where we need to improve and what we're doing well is management intensive grazing we're rotating the animals we're not disturbing the soil we're not taking too much uh, taking too much forage from a particular pasture is going to cause a soil disturbance because the root system is going to slow down. We talk about it a lot of times in terms of the root system dying back if we graze it, when in all reality it's really that it slows down from it being grazed too hard. Uh, we're doing that well. Where we need to improve? Uh, we've got a lot of compaction issues in our pasture. Most of those are legacy from our overgrazing days or from our continuous grazing days, but we do have some compaction issues. We've got plow pants left from when those areas were cropped. Uh, this is a good time of the year to be talking about pugging. We've got pugging out there in our soils from the winter time. And just these last few rains with me having cattle out, I, I've noticed some areas that have gotten pugged a little bit. Uh, now I'll, I'll say that I, I've always was told that one hoof print isn't going to hurt you it's that second and third and fourth and fifth and hundredth footprint that's going to cause you problems but it's something we need to be watching for high traffic areas are in and around water troughs uh, in and out of shade areas those are areas where we've caused a soil disturbance and as i mentioned we you know when we'll talk about later fertilizers and manure and pesticides because i had some other ideas to talk about i'm in no way saying that we don't use those things I'm saying that manure is the solution on soil health. Too much manure, though, can, can cause us some issues. Uh, but we will talk about them further in a later slide just because I had some other things to, that I wanted to, to talk about. But just realize that we need to be thinking about a, a, a low rate more often than a, a high rate less frequently. That, that, will, that will do us some good in the long run in most cases. Maximizing soil cover is our next key to soil health. And in a grazing operation, this is another place where we, we do well. Uh, we are leaving residue after we graze the livestock through. Um, but in a cropland situation, we'd be talking about uh, corn stover or bean stubble or wheat straw being left over in the field. And as we look into soil health, you'll see guys take a thermometer out in the field and stick it in the ground where there isn't cover on the soil and in one where there is cover and it's not uncommon on a hot July day in Ohio for our soils to be in excess of 20 degrees warmer in the bare area than it is in the shaded area and that has a huge effect on our soil biology our watering and holding capacity on the amount of forage or crop we're able to produce 
So we always want to think about keeping that soil covered. And, and, and with grazing, we, we do leave a residue, although I, I'm still in search of a better word. I think clean solar collector would be a better word than residue, but it's too many words. Uh, we do a good job of it, but uh, if you know me and, and you're a part of the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council, you know that one of the challenges that I've laid down for all of you is to leave more residue. So if you watch that pasture walk video we put together last week and watch me using the pasture stick, uh, you notice that I, I said, you know, this looks like four or five inches of pasture, whatever it was. We need to be carrying a pasture stick with us. We need to be carrying a yard stick with us to look at what four inches of forage really looks like and what a proper residue looks like. If four inches is what we're trying to leave behind. Um, but we really need to be measuring that and getting our mind's eye trained to what the proper amount of residue looks like. I think so often we start out in the spring with good intentions, but our residues sink as the spring and summer and fall carry on. So we need to be concerned about our soil cover and making sure we leave enough residue after the livestock move on to the next pasture. <laughs> Maximizing our biodiversity. Um, you'll see soil health guys split this into two slides where they talk about diverse crop rotations and integrating livestock. For those of us in pasture, it kind of makes sense that they're all together because we've already integrated livestock. But with that being said, we can work on diversifying our crop out there. We can add some things to make our forage toward more diverse. And if you've been around the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council, you know that's been one of my challenges as well, is to diversify our sward uh, with legumes or forbs in addition to the grasses we already have. When I go out in the field, it's pretty easy for me to find orchard grass or fescue or bluegrass. Sometimes I have to search long and hard to find a legume. And uh, we need to make sure that we're getting legumes incorporated in the soil. We need to make sure we're incorporating or getting forbs into the soil as well uh, for our livestock out there. And why would we not? Why would we not want some diversity? The diversity is going to do nothing but help the microbes blow the soil. If, if we're talking about legumes, we're talking about a plant that can pull down atmospheric nitrogen, run it into the soil. The microbes can get a hold of it and feed it to the grass plant next door, which will do nothing but help our production, both in our forages, but also in our livestock in the end. So we need to think about adding those different classes of, of forages to our pasture. The other one we don't talk much about is woody species. You know, if we've got goats, a woody species is a great extension to our biodiversity out there in the field. And then the second part about this you know, with the crop guys, they talk about integrating livestock with us. I think we need to talk about diversifying our livestock a little bit. Um, this may be for a feeder calf producer. It may be just holding over some of those feeder calves until the spring and help us manage the spring flush. Those are different classes of livestock. Now, yes, they're, they're still beef cow, but um, they're going to eat a little different than what our cows do. And then after that, you all know me, you know that I have beef cattle, I have hogs, but we also have sheep and goats and poultry. And someday there'll even be a pony in our house. Um, <clears throat> we diversify our livestock and it's done nothing but help our forages in the end. I can go through the fields where the sheep have grazed and not find many ironweed plants. If I have a field that the sheep haven't grazed, I'll find a bunch of ironweed plants later in the summer. The sheep really work on our marlflower rolls. Uh, through the summer and even into the winter. So diversifying our livestock has done nothing but help diversify our herd underneath of the grass, that being our soil microbes as well. Um, I, I know some of you are reluctant to add different livestock or do different things with your livestock, but I, I'm here to tell you the farms I visit, I, I go to a lot of them, the, the fence that they have is already ready for a different kind of livestock, goats, sheep, whatever it may be. Uh, and one thing I thought about last week when I was doing the, the pasture walk was moving that bull and keeping him with his friends and, and his friends are all the sheep and he's kind of their king. And, you know, that would work out for a lot of producers. I go to places that the bull's kind of fenced off in a mud lot or in a pen in a barn or in a paddock completely separated from himself. And, and I think, it, boy, wouldn't it be nice if 
we would see more folks get some brush goats to help clean up mawflower rows. Go ahead and rotate that bull through a series of paddocks or through the paddocks that the cows aren't in and, and let them work on those forages that they that they prefer. That's a way to diversify our livestock. And in the end, it's a way to diversify the pasture as well because those other things are getting used as forage. And then we need to think about maximizing the presence of a living root. For the most part with pastures, we're doing a really good job of that. Our, our forages aren't dying in the winter. They're still growing. They're still root out there. They're still living. But in the cropland areas where we're growing a cash crop and then the fields set fallow, typically for the winter time, we're not growing a living root in those soils. Like I said, for pasture, we're typically doing a good job. And so I got that down as, as what we're doing well. We've got a living root out there in the soil. And where, where could we improve on that? Well, I think we could still do better. I talked a minute a while ago there about uh, we've got cool season forages in eastern Ohio. Maybe we need to think about integrating some warm seasons. They're gonna, the roots are going to grow better during the warmer season of the year. Um, maybe we can think about putting on some cool season annuals in our perennial pasture just to help keep our roots. It's going to help with the diversity we just talked about but also help with our root system being more alive um, during other parts of the year that, that our cool season grasses have sort of slowed down. There are many different options out there. I know I mentioned Les Padiza is a warm season annual, reseeds, typically reseeds itself. There are lots of others. There are parts of the world they use Red, Red River crabgrass as a reseeding summer annual grass. Um, there, there are lots of things out there that we could think about. I know that I've had producers talk about cereal rye late in the fall for a, a late fall, probably more early spring type grazing. I've planted oats and turnips in perennial pastures before. Um, just we need to think about that living root and do we have a living root out there in the field? The other thing about that is, you know, our high traffic areas, our water facilities, our edges of our heavy use pad. Do we have a living root in those soils to help keep them going, especially in the winter months? I said earlier that I would talk about fertilizers, pesticides, and our soil health um, in a later slide. And uh, I guess what I wanted to cover more than anything else is with soil health, it's realizing that these are tools in our toolbox. And for so long, we treated fertilizers and pesticides as the only tool in our toolbox if we needed an improvement. And uh, you know, the old saying says that if, if the only tool you have in your toolbox is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. Uh, we now with soil health and all these thoughts, we've got a lot of different tools in our toolbox. We've got livestock integration, we've got manures, we've got compost, we've got all those different things. And uh, I mean, I, I find myself reaching for a fertilizer bag too often probably when I can find another solution or why maybe maybe what we're seeing is the symptom of something that we're doing. I'm by no means saying that or saying that I'm anti-fertilizer or pesticide. I'm not. What I'm what I'm saying is that I'm anti too much. Uh, I think we've got some solutions with soil health. I think that we you know we can use legumes to help pull nitrogen down. We get that biology working in the soil. We can bring to life uh, some of the nutrients that are stored in the soil and use them with our plants and therefore to grow our animals. I, I just think we need to reevaluate our use of fertilizer, pesticides, uh, manures and heavy applications and, and lots of other practices. Uh, our, our soils are very, very diverse, and, and there is a lot of things that affect other things, and uh, we need to use them when they're needed, of course, uh, but sparingly if possible, because uh, we've got some other functions that are going on. It's realizing all the things that one application of something may affect. Uh, again, like I said, I am no means saying I'm anti-fertilizer or pesticide. I'm not. Uh, I'm just anti too much and, and I think we need to, to reevaluate our, our system and think about how much how much we're using those tools and 
may be using them in the wrong place. Something that my increased interest in soil health has brought to light, we, we've talked about compost and about composting our heavy use bad manure before in the Eastern Ohio grazing meetings. I've read a lot of things about farmers that compost manure and create compost. And for the most part, for all those years, I've thought, why? Why are they wasting their time? Why not just go ahead and go out there and spread that manure and, and be done with it and not waste the time turning it or doing all the things that we do? But as I've increased my depth of study and of soil health, I've come to realize that compost in the end isn't really just a fertilizer. It's needed to be seen as an amendment and as a soil health amendment. So a soil health builder, a soil health feeder. Uh, if we compost manure, we're, we're breaking it down into uh, and allowing those that biology, the soil microbes to flourish in that manure, putting air in the system, which there's air in our soil. If we just spread um, manure that's been stacked, it's anaerobic by and large, other than maybe the top foot where it's been aerated. Uh, so by by creating and using compost, we're we're helping our soil health in the end. And one thing, one of the cool things I found with all the things I've studied is a, a, a method called Johnson Sioux composting. It's, it's a no-turn aerated compost. It's got some interesting results. It's it's uh, kind of a newer thing it's it's really young to even consider all the benefits but uh, something that I'm interested in something I'm going to think about doing with some of our manures to use as a kind of a soil inoculant uh, for our soil health not by any means recommending it to anyone I just think it's something cool that if any of you are interested in compost that maybe you ought to take a look at there are other products you know with everything we've talked about Everything that we've got going on in the world, uh, I've heard of farmers applying milk as a soil health amendment. Now, we don't want to apply too much. The farmers are saying that apply it are saying one gallon to the acre is enough to help our soil health. So, and there are millions of products for sale, some that I believe are probably good and some not so good for our soil health. Uh, it, it takes some research on all of them to, to see whether they're actually helping our soil health or whether they're not, but they're out there. So I guess we're just trying to feed and replenish the microbes in the soil. We're trying to build their populations up and we're trying to feed the ones that we currently have. And compost or other soil amendment may be in order to help us uh, in that process. As promised, we talked earlier about uh, other videos and other things that I watch, uh, trying to bring some positivity into what I'm what I'm doing, and I just wanted to take a minute to to send out just a few that I've watched. There are millions of things out there you can watch on YouTube that relates to what we do here at Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. But some that I found that were kind of cool was the Soil Carbon Cowboys. Um, They've got a website that's got lots of videos listed on it that you can go and you can watch. Uh, those guys, um, Alan Williams is involved with that group, Gabe Brown, Neil Dennis up in Canada, and there's lots of other farms. Will Harris, uh, some others that are involved with the Soil Carbon Cowboys. Uh, really cool videos out there. The other one, um, Pasture Project, the Adaptive Grazing 101 video tutorials. Um, a good series. There's a bunch of videos in that series. Uh, cover everything pasture management, adaptive grazing management wise. A uh, really good set of videos to sit down and, and watch and listen to. And I honestly, I've listened to them several, some of them several times. And then I listed that Johnson Sioux composting that I just, that I just uh, mentioned in that last slide. Um, good videos out there on that method. It kind of got me thinking anyway about soil health and as it relates to soil health. Again, by no means am I recommending it. I'm just saying that it's it's a very interesting process, something that I think bears some more study. Well, that's a wrap for this Eastern Ohio Grazing Council web presentation on continued focus on soil health. Uh, we'll end this presentation by thanking our sponsors. Also, thank you to all of you who have 
uh, called us with comments or questions or ideas for future pasture walk we sure do appreciate it we appreciate hearing from all of you uh, this week too a special shout out to those folks in North Dakota and Florida and even Italy that watched our virtual pasture walk last week kind of an interesting thought to know that these web presentations have went that far uh, we we're doing this just simply to fill a void um, for our eastern Ohio grazing community here in the counties that we serve in eastern Ohio and uh, hoping that we're filling that void and giving our folks something to think about uh, in the time that we can't meet in face-to-face -face meetings so again we sure do appreciate it we'll see you next time